Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another week of online services here at OCL of First United Methodist Church and Joiner First United Methodist Church. Uh, we're going to quickly jump into everything today because I was recording and there was uh, some issues um, outside, so I uh, had to stop recording. And you know, I just you know, I'm just kind of in one of those one of those moods right now, but not a big deal. Uh, but we're just going to go ahead and jump into the sermon itself. So. <clears throat> If you have your Bibles, of course, you'll see it here in just a second. But if you have your Bibles, jump over to Luke chapter 19, 16, not 19, Luke chapter 16, and we'll be reading verse 19 to 31. Luke chapter 16, verse 19 to 31. All right, and the word says this. And there was a rich man who dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. And his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus. Covered, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came out and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away, with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me. And send Lazarus to dip it the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that you're in that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from you from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family. For I have five brothers, and for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, If you do not listen to Moses and the prophets, then they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So have you ever gone to a carnival before? I'm sure all of you can say yes, or a fall festival where they have carnival games. Um, have you ever played a carnival game? Again, I'm sure most of you can say absolutely you have. What are they? Well, they're they're super fun at times. Uh, they can be very addicting because, you know, give a, give a dollar for a chance to throw a ball into a hoop or, you know, knock down... Uh, some cups or, you know, uh, pop a balloon, you know, something fun like that. They're addicting. They can be addicting. They're often unbeatable uh, for a very good reason. And that is they don't want you to win because, you know, they don't, you know, they want to make the game harder because they don't want to lose their prizes because that would, you know, defeat the purpose of the carnival game. And the purpose of the carnival game, to be honest with you, is to get money, not for you to win. Um, but there's a thrill. There's a thrill in the game. Now, I've told you, I just, I've just mentioned that, you know, you're not supposed to win this game. Uh, so there's some, there can be some sadness in losing. Sometimes things happen in where we feel like we've been cheated out of, we've been cheated out of our wins. For instance, my buddy JJ, we went to a fall festival uh, when he was uh, in Wiener, Arkansas one time, or still in Wiener, Arkansas, preaching. And while he was there... Uh, he played a game, and the prize of the game was a PS4, uh, PlayStation 4. So it was a video game system, which is pretty big, pretty big system, uh, or pretty big prize to win. Well, he did everything he was supposed to do, and he got all the balls into like the hoop or something like that. It wasn't a hoop; I think it was like a, a circle. And the guy was like, the guy was kind of taken back. You could tell he was taken back. And then he said, "Well, you know, you you did the game wrong," and he's like. How to do the game wrong? And he said, "Well, you, you, I think JJ done it underhanded, and he wasn't told he wasn't supposed to do it underhanded, like throw underhanded." And he's like, "You know, you're supposed to throw it overhanded, or maybe vice versa. It doesn't matter." <laughs> so obviously, we questioned it. Uh, he didn't come away with a PS4 like he should have, but he did come away with a prize because I think we, you know, we got into the guy's skin a little bit because it wasn't fair. But again, these games aren't designed for us to win; they're designed for us to lose. So. We're gonna bring this up again in a little bit, but I just want you to I want you to be thinking about that as we continue on. Now, what is our story about today? Well, our story about today is, you know, the rich man, the rich man and Lazarus. Um, there, you know, you can maybe guess that Jesus was using Lazarus as like just a template here. 
because, you know, he has his friend named Lazarus. But I wouldn't, you know, I don't, it's not really a reason to put a lot of stock into that uh, from everything I've read and studied on this. Uh, so, you know, just if you feel like, oh, Jesus is talking about the Lazarus that he knows, possibly. I mean, we all use stories at times. I'll, I'll make up a story. Not Most of the stories I tell you here, I think, are pretty true um, and everything. Uh, but if I'm, you know, if I'm using like a, like if I'm just making up something, I might, uh, you know, throw in people that I know just because. There's a certain rich man who we get to experience how rich he is. Uh, and how rich is he? No troubles at all. In that world, that's really good. Uh, it means he's, you know, we've talked about the wealthy before uh, and why they're wealthy in this world. You know, we're not taking away that some people manage to work their way all the way up to being so wealthy that they didn't have any troubles at all. But, you know, you could see that they probably cut corners or, you know, didn't help when they needed help, which is kind of like a theme of this story. Uh, so they get to a point where they are so rich that they they don't have to worry about anything in life. Food, famine, well, it's kind of really the same thing. Food, famine, worrying about, you know, taxes, because they did take a lot of taxes and whatnot. They didn't have to, he didn't have to, he was one of those people that didn't have to worry about that kind of predicament. So we are... We are introduced to this rich man. He's able to dress in the finest clothes. He lives life in luxury every single day. And the story immediately veers into a beggar. This beggar is named Lazarus. And this beggar named Lazarus lives the exact opposite life of the rich man. Um, he's not taken care of. He's covered in sores. Um, he's constantly hungry. So, you know, he's every single day he's worried about, you know, he's got to, he's got to worry about um uh, what he's going to eat. He's got to worry about what he's, how he's going to survive day in and day out. Um, and he's so far, he's so far in trouble. He's so far in need that, and so hungry that what he longs for the most is just to eat what has fallen from the rich man's table as the text has come to, or the text has told us. It appears that no one takes care of him at all. Uh, because even the dogs come up and lick his sores that he has. So he's sick. He is homeless, it appears. Um, you know, and he's hungry. And all he can do is just sit outside the rich man's house and hope hope that maybe, maybe one day, he's able to just get some of the scraps from the rich man's table. It's not a good life that he lives. And we, we're, you know, it juxtaposes with the rich man's life who lives an incredibly luxurious life, luxurious life with no troubles whatsoever. And I ask you this question. Because what we're what we're told is that, you know, is that the man is at the rich man or Lazarus is at the rich man's gate. How often do you think that the rich man honestly thought about Lazarus? How often do you think the rich man honestly thought about Lazarus? I'd wager it's probably as much as we think about others. He knew Lazarus was there. Um, we're going to discuss that here in a little bit. He knew Lazarus was there and everything, but he it might not have been as much as, you know, he might not have thought about him much at all. So much so that he didn't even bother with giving Lazarus any kind of leftovers or whatnot, or, you know, maybe even like giving him something to where the dogs could be, you know, scared off from, you know, coming up and licking him and everything, licking his sores and whatnot. So I'd wager it's as much as we probably think about others. And that's kind of like a, terrifying terrifying reality that we have to face now when i was going to seminary um which was you know i would most of the time i would be driving from mammoth spring arkansas to um to memphis tennessee and what would i see as i got into memphis well i would see plenty of people that you would call beggars the people on the side of the road that have uh that have um uh, signs up talking about needing money or talking about needing needing food, things like that. And I'm going to be real with you. I'm going to be very honest with you. There were days that I would do something. I would give them money or I would give them food that I had. Like I don't I don't usually give like food that I've already eaten off of because you know just in case like there's some kind of you know I'm sick or anything like that. But if I had extra food, I would absolutely give them extra food. I would give them extra drinks that I have and whatnot. There were days that I would do that. 
and there were days I would do nothing at all. I would just drive on past them. And I could make all the excuses I wanted to. Well, I don't have money today. I don't have any physical cash on me today. Or I don't have any actual food on me today. The truth is, I just didn't want to deal with them that day. That's to be honest with you. Now, you know, and I know that's horrible to say, but that's that's the reality of the situation. Is I didn't want to even bother trying to help at that time. Often, the bad often weighs out, outweighs the good. And we have plenty of excuses why we don't help the people that appear to be in need um and yes there's a there's a there's a there's a nuanced discussion that we're not going to necessarily have right here about the people that are in need or that appear to be in need but most of the time i'm gathering that we're probably driving past them more often than we're helping them and whatnot so we're thinking about them as much as the rich man thought about Lazarus. Now you could also make the argument, Hey Ryan, you helped. And you know, I've helped before. That's way more than the rich man helped. And Hey, that that's fair. That's a very fair thing to say, uh, because it is true. The rich man appeared to never give Lazarus anything from the story that Jesus is telling us through this parable and the lesson that Jesus is telling us through this parable. Well, eventually as the story progresses on, what happens? Well, they both die. We, we learn of that Lazarus' death first. Um, and when Lazarus die, dies, the angels come and carry him away to heaven. Um, then we learn that the rich man dies and he is taken to Hades. Well, you know, and I, the reason why Hades is used here, uh, is really just, you know, viewer's choice or, you know, speaker's choice here. You can call it hell. You can call it Sheol. Um, whether, no matter how you look at it in this text, it's not a pleasant place to be. And we're not going to dive into what those places are right now um, for the purpose of this conversation, the purpose of this text. But he is taken away to Sheol. He is, ta or he is taken away to Hades. And while he's in Hades, what happens? Well, we have this scene where the rich man, he looks up. We don't have his name, so we're just going to, you know, we call him the rich man. The rich man is able to look up and see Lazarus. And he asked Abraham if Lazarus would just dip his t dip the tip of his finger into water and let him have a drop that he might be able to cool his tongue and whatnot. And Abraham has a response. What is Abraham's response? Abraham says, no, no, not at all. Um, the reason is, and Abraham goes on to say, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Besides all this, between us us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. So, again, while he's in Hades, this rich man, he wants some water because he's, you know, he wants to be replenished. Just the tip, Just a drop of water would do good for him. And Abraham tells him, no, that's not possible. And the reason why it's not possible is because he had his chance to help. He had his chance to do more. He had his chance um, to worry about more than himself and his wealth. And he did nothing about it. Lazarus was on the outside always. And he did absolutely nothing about it. Um, let's take a look at Carnival Games again. Told you it would come back up. What does a carnival game do? You have all of this money at your disposal. Well, you have a little bit of money at your disposal. And if you don't make the shot, what happens? You don't win the prize. Now, I know earlier I said something about, well, these games are cheated. But the truth of the matter is, it's the money that you have. Uh, and if you choose to use that money and not make any kind of shot at all, you know, you can't win a prize. So having all that money at your disposal and you don't make the shot, you don't win the prize. What does this have to do with any of this? Well, Lazarus sat outside his house every single day. I told you already, he knew who Lazarus was. That's the thing. That is that is the maybe the one of the most difficult things to take away from this story is he knew who Lazarus was. He doesn't say, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Can you send that beggar who sat at my gate every single day to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in his life. He knew Lazarus' name. Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his water finger, to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue 
because I am an agony in this fire. He had all that wealth at his disposal and he never took a opportunity to help Lazarus at all. And if that's all he needed to get into heaven, he lost his shot. He lost his chance. Lazarus sat outside his house every day. He knew who Lazarus was. All those chances to help and not a single time did he decide to help. Well, he realizes at that point, uh, at this point in the story, that, okay, well, nothing can be done for me. Well, then he decides that he wants to at least stop others from coming into the same situation that he's into right now, which I think is pretty fair, uh, to be honest with you. So he asked Abraham to send an angel to warn his brothers. Um, <clears throat> actually, not an angel, Lazarus. He asked a Abraham to send Lazarus to warn his brothers about Hades and what must be done to stay away from there. Even go as far as to say as to beg that someone from the dead can show them the way. Again, he's told no, that's not possible. Why? Well, they have the law in Moses. And what do we know about the law that is told, or the law and the prophets, or the prophets and Moses? What, is, what do they impress upon so many, in so many ways, at so many times, um, in so many instances? Well, they impress upon them, do all the good you can for all the people you can in all the ways you can. Love God, love one another. If you, if you adhere to the love God part, everyone can, I don't, don't want to get this wrong, everyone is able to understand that first part really well. Well, I love God. I love God. I love God. But it really, what does it truly mean to love God? If you truly love God, you're loving other people. You're treating other people with respect. You're treating other people with, uh, with dignity. You are helping other people when you see them the most in need. They have that. They've been given that. They've been taught that from a young age. So if you ignore the instructions, how can you ever be prepared to win the fair game? Because this game is fair. This life is fair in that way. If we have more than we need, then we can give it to those that need help. And we'll be sitting okay with God. And not only that, we'll be putting good into the world, hopefully for the sake of putting good into the world. I told you. You know, it's kind of this theme around fall festival carnival games. Um, <clears throat> we were, uh, when we were in Mammoth Spring, we had a couple of fall festivals um, that we held in our town. And at one of these, you know, or these, we, we tried to do things, you know, like the giving the way of the candy and whatnot. And we, we made little, we made little games to play. And every time a kid came by, they were always so eager to throw uh, or to, you know, uh, to do these games um, and throw a ball into a hoop because they knew they could get candy. The thing is, they generally lost because they didn't listen. But we still gave them candy. We still did what, you know, we still we still made sure they did. But when the ones that did listen to the instructions, they knew exactly what to do, they won. They won fair and square. Again, that's that's what we're supposed to be doing in life. We're supposed to be listening to the instructions. Sometimes we might fail, but if we're listening to the instructions, we're following the instructions, we're doing what we're supposed to do, then we're okay. We're going to be okay. We're going to be fine. We're going to be right in the eyes of God. And what are the instructions? Love God and love neighbor. And we do this unselfishly. We do this selflessly. That's how we're supposed to be winning. That's Or that's how we're supposed to be living so that we'll we'll be winners in life. That's the true way of winning in life is doing right by others, doing good by others. A lot of people, they take this text and they just want to look at it as like a, as a, you know, as a, a specific text about hell or specific text about Hades or, or Sheol. That's not what Jesus is getting at in this text. And when we lose the meaning of that, when we, when we, when we ignore that for, Oh, well, this is, you know, this is what this says about hell then we lose the everything else. And what is everything else? What is the most important part of the story? There is a person who knew another person. One person was rich. The other person had nothing at all. And the other person was so ate up in their own wealth, was so ate up in their own comfort, in their own security, they had so much that they, they had so much already, but were unable, were unable to sacrifice even a little bit of that, even a little bit of that to help the person that was in need, 
when it was all said and done, God saved the one who was in need. And the person that lived the selfish life, that person went on to torment. That person went on to being separated from God. But again, the most important part of this is seeing that there's a person in need and when we have the ability to help them in any way, in any way, then we, then we do what we can to help that person. When we read this story, we should be coming away again with the understanding that Christ is all around us. Christ is waiting for us there in the poor Lazarus. This is the Christ, This is the message of Christ. Christ wants us to help those in need, and if we ignore Him. If we ignore the Lazaruses in our world constantly because we don't want to attempt to sacrifice anything, then what are we doing? We're ignoring Christ. And if we help them, then we come back to God. Then we, then we have a pathway to heaven. And it's not helping them for the sake of getting to heaven. It's helping them for the sake of helping them. If we help him, then we will see the Christ. Then we will know what it means to live that life that he's teaching to live in here, in this story right here. It's a selfless life. It's one that we might find ourselves in, a, in, a, in, in abundance. And when we find ourselves in abundance, we're able to help those who can't help themselves. People say often, what can I do? The answer's, the answer's already been given to you. And I'm not saying that facetiously. I think that's the right word. I'm not saying that antagonistically, but the answers are to be given to you. Be good. Be kind. Help those in need in any way that you can. It doesn't mean you have to, to break yourself, to hurt your own family, to hurt your own self to help others in need. But if you have, a, if you have food that you can give away, give it away. If you have a little bit of money that you can give away, give it away. Do all the good you can for all the people you can in all the ways you can. If the rich man would have listened, or if the rich man would have lived his life differently, Lazarus might have been okay. Lazarus might have been helped in this life. That's what we should be taking away from this story. The answer has been given to us. The instructions have been given to us already. Love God and love one another unconditionally through Christ's words and actions. That's how we live. He shows you what to do and that you can do this. It's possible. So, let me ask. Will you be like the rich man in this story? Or will you be like the Christ? Or will you seek the Christ by helping others? Remember, you're given the chances. If you squander those chances, then there is no turning back. Once this game is finished, this game called life is finished. There's none. Seek Christ. Do good. Help others that are in need. You can do this. We can do this together. In his name, we all go now. Amen. I hope you all have a very blessed week. I hope you go into this world being the hands and feet of Christ, knowing that Christ is with you wherever you go, and knowing that Christ will help you in all that you do for the sake of this world, for the good of this world. Go together. Go with Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.